Don't you just love some of those great hymns of the church, the, the hymn that Dale just sang? Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. Now that I'm waiting, yielded and still. Just waiting on the Lord. Not rushing what the world wants you to do. Just wait on the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll be mounted up on wings as eagles. Yielding to Him. Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Whatever you want me to go, I'll go. I just want to be what you want me to be. Not what the world molds me to be. What you want me to be. And just being still, just being still and knowing that He is God. Sometimes I think about that wonderful painting. Many of you may have seen it. It's the painting of Daniel. He's in the lion's den. He's on his knees and he's looking up to God and the light is on him. There's a smile on his face and all the lions have their mouth shut and they're sleeping. This is what God does to us when we have all the trials and the lions of the world that are after you. You just look up and say, Father, I'm waiting on you. I'm yielding to you. I'm being still and knowing that you are God and this is yours. I give it to you. How important that is. I want to ask you three questions. Do you ever need encouraging? Does God ever ask you to encourage someone else? And have you ever been encouraged by someone, maybe a friend, maybe a parent, maybe a schoolmate, that encouraged you when you needed it the most and it just came out of nowhere? Nobody knew you were grieving. Nobody knew you were in trouble. But that person God just sent to give that special word of wisdom and encouragement. So let's talk about Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> the Lord which came to Jeremiah, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. And the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel. And it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Look at the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O Israel. Now let's talk briefly about each one of those verses. And I want you to put yourself on that potter's wheel as we read these verses again. And let God speak through you. The word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. Why did Jeremiah go? Because God told him to go. He said, go. How often does God tell us to do something? To go somewhere, to do, to do a certain thing, to be with a certain person to give that encouraging word to them. Go and don't hesitate. Then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something on the wheel. We are all on the potter's wheel of life. And we're going to go through circumstances as that wheel turns and sometimes we're not going to understand what God is doing as he's molding us and making us into what he wants us to be. And the vessel he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, and it seemed good to the potter to make. God believes in do-overs. You're going to mess up on this wheel of life. You're going to go through sin and temptations and all those things that you want to look back on and live in the past on, and the potter is always molding you and making you into what He wants you to be and looking to the future. He has forgiven you. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, 
I will listen. You will find me when you seek me if you search for me in earnest. And I love the last verse the most. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Hmm. How about, O Black Oak Heights Baptist Church, O Mike Chesney, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, Black Oak Heights Baptist Church. Let the word penetrate your heart. Speak to your heart. How I love God's word. Particularly in those times of troubles and in strife. Jeremiah went to the potter's house for a very clear message, didn't he? He said, I love you and I want to be intimately involved in your life. Every stage of your life, no matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, I'm with you. I want to create something useful in you. And when you mess up, I'm there to forgive you. I brought this piece of clay as an illustration Just think that you're on that potter's wheel of life and God has you in his hands. And he's molding you and making you into what he wants you to be. Not what the world says you've got to be. Not what all your friends say you've got to be. Just focus on God and he continues to mold you and prune away all those rough edges that are holding you back, fulfilling the plan That he has for your life. See, he's committed to his work. He gives us that heart of flesh that is soft and is pliable. So when it's touched by the finger of God, he molds you and he makes you what he wants you to be. Don't let the world harden your heart and force you into being something you're not. Because it can become hard and cold and callous. He is always preparing us for what he has prepared for us. We just need to keep his finger on our heart. Potter wants to create something beautiful in you. And you don't always know what the end result's going to be. But he starts with that piece of clay on the wheel of life. And pretty soon he's molded you into something that is beautiful something that's useful and something that can be used by you to satisfy the needs of the world that we need to be salt and light in. The potter believes in do-overs. When you mess up, get on your knees before God and confess it. He loves you and he loves you because of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He can do for us what we cannot ever do for ourselves. He loved us so much, guys. God stepped out of eternity into time through the virgin birth, and Jesus Christ preached on this earth, went to the cross and shed his blood and died for us, was buried, rose and walked in the newness of life. So that we can have life and we can put all of our sin, all of our guilt at the foot of the cross and let his blood wash our sins away. And we start new each and every moment. He just forgives and forgives and forgives and keeps molding you and making you into what he wants you to be. And the devil hates that. He quivers, he shakes, he trembles when he hears John 3.16. He's after you. He wants to keep you discouraged. Let me tell you something. Billy Graham always said, Churchgoers are like coals of fire. When they cling together, they keep the flame aglow, and separated, they die out. Black oak, stay together. Encourage one another. Love one another. There are things going on 
behind everybody's life. We all have stuff that we're dealing with. Give that encouraging word any time that you can. And sometimes we take life for granted, we take God for granted, and we forget sometimes who we're praying to, don't we? Oh, God, help me with this. Oh, God, see me through that. And we don't really focus on the great I am that I am, the God of the universe, the creator of life, the creator of the creation. We are praying to the I am that I am. Sometimes we forget it. Moses at the burning bush argued with him. He said, who are you? God said, I am that I am. Christ made it very clear who he was. I am the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the, gate, I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the true vine. And when that high priest questioned him, are you the Christ, the blessed one? He didn't say, I think so. Yes, he said, I am. This is who we're praying to. The great news that Jesus himself has the, day, the door open for us to come freely into his kingdom. What a message of encouragement that is. When I was on staff at First Baptist Morristown, we were having a finance meeting, and things were kind of tight and tough, as they often get in churches, and we were talking uh, uh, among us, and there was a young man about 26 years old, a brilliant CPA who was on the finance committee. He was just married. And we were talking, and I was sort of discouraged. And I said, well, I guess we're all in the same boat. We'll get through it. And Joe said to me, Mike, we're all in the same boat, but isn't it great that Jesus is in this boat? Now, I'll be 66 in December. Here is a 26-year-old CPA that's giving me that word of encouragement when I needed it the most. Here I am trying to lead the finance committee. He led it for me in that moment. Has that ever happened to you? Be open to those kind words of encouragement. And again, I, wanted to, I want to warn you. Satan hates this. He hates it. If he came to you, that great liar, that great deceiver, and he said, you know what? tired of fooling with y'all. I'm going to auction off all my tools. I'm getting out of business. I'm going to auction off pride and laziness, arrogance, hate, envy, jealousy. I'm going to get rid of all of it. There's one tool that he will never, ever get rid of and auction off. And that's that tool of discouragement. If he can get you depressed enough, get you down enough, get your self-esteem so low that he can mold you and make you into his image, he will do it in a heartbeat. And don't think he doesn't know how to get you. You know what? He could, he could build a warehouse of a liquor store and put me in the middle of it and say, it's all yours, drink up and be happy. I would say, thank you very much, but I just don't have that desire. He's not going to do that to me. But he knows where he can get Mike. He knows where he can get me in that little sin that we all struggle with. And he knows where he can get you too. Be careful. Don't be discouraged by the evil one. I love Jude 1 9 when the devil was arguing with Moses, with uh, with the, the devil was arguing with Michael, the archangel, over the body of Moses. And Michael didn't argue. He didn't get upset. He just said, may the Lord rebuke you. When those attacks from the evil one come to discourage you and tell you that you are nobody, you just say, may the Lord rebuke you. Oh, Father, I know that you made me into somebody. Mold me and make me into what you want me to be and let me fulfill the plan that you have for my life. Encouraging someone else is so important. Let me ask you a couple of questions. You, can you tell me who the last five Miss Americas were in the country? The last five Pulitzer Prize winners, the Nobel Prize winners. How about the last five Heisman Trophy winners, the last five Super Bowl winners? Can you tell me? 
sure was important at the moment. They had their 15 minutes in the sun. I can't remember them either. Now let me ask you a question. As I look around the room, think about this. How many of you can remember the name of your first grade teacher? Look at that. Wow. Why? Because she encouraged you. She loved you. She spent time with you. How about those coaches that gave us that extra special something that we needed at that time? Pushed us a little farther than we thought. Maybe a friend, maybe a relative, maybe a pastor who just loved on you and said, come here, let's talk and pray. And you never forgot it. I don't often give a couple of personal illustrations in a message, but I, I think I will today. My side of the family comes out of Union County up in Luttrell and Plainview. My mama was born on the farm, raised on the farm, died on the farm. Legendary cook, man, she could do it all. And I loved her. She walked on water for me. She outlived my grandfather by 25 years. She finished raising 10 kids in that farmhouse. And I spent a lot of time growing up. When I first got married, I visited her. And I went out into the area to chop some wood in the wintertime. And I lost my wedding ring. I had just gotten married. And it fell down in the pile. I didn't say anything about it. About a week later, I went up to visit her, and she looked at my hand. She says, where's your ring? I said, oh, ma'am, oh, I was out in the woods there, you know, cutting some, wood, cutting some wood for the fireplace. I'll take care of it. I want you to get another one. I said, okay. When you're 23 and married, you don't think like you should sometimes. Guys are just out there looking and thinking and doing, and they're not paying attention to some of the promises they make. I came back about a month later. Mama opened the door. She looked at my hand. She says, where's your ring? I told you to go get one. I said, Mama, I will. I promise I'll go get one. I, you know, those things are expensive. Karen hadn't said anything about it. I, I'll, I'll get it. Don't worry about it. She looked at me with those piercing brown eyes of hers. And she held up her left hand. And she took off her wedding band. And she put it on my finger. She said, I never want to see you without a wedding ring again. You not wearing that ring is going to get you in trouble, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And she touched her hand, took her hand, touched my cheek, and said, I love you. There's a chocolate pie waiting on you, and I never want to bring this up again. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. Words of encouragement, even when they have that soft discipline, are so very, very important. And I have a word for all you senior adults out there. God is not finished with you. Your job now is to pass on that legacy of wisdom, that encouraging word to your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. Let them see the strength of the Lord in you. One generation shall praise your works to another. Leave a legacy of encouragement. Even in your old age and gray hair, I will sustain you. I made you. I will carry you. I will sustain you. I recognize you. I rescue you. I love you. Psalm 112.2 says, His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. One generation shall praise your works to another. Leave that legacy of love and that wisdom and encouragement to those kids. And I know sometimes, you, I know what you're thinking. Sometimes they, well, they come over to my house and they love on me a little bit and they eat all my food and trash my house and they leave and they go home. They don't think about it anymore. Oh, yes, they do. They hang on every word you say, every action you have. To this day, some... Fifty years later, I still remember things my mamma said to me, scriptures she read to me, songs that she sang to me. I remember the clothes she wore. I remember Wednesdays was her hair day, and you did not mess with her on hair day. 
I remember how she smelled. Every time I smell lavender, I think of her. The impact, the sheer horsepower of a praying grandma and grandpa cannot be matched. I'm going to ask you to go do something today. When you go home, I want you to have lunch. I want you to relax. Then I want you to go to your desk. and I want Mama, I want you to pull out your cards. I want you to write a note to your children, your grandchildren. All you have to say is, Mama and Papa are thinking about you today. I love you. You're as good as the best and better than the rest. Best of the best. We love you. Mail it to them. Cost you 50 cents, I guess. They're going to get that. They're going to open it up. They're going to go, well, hey, what's that all about? It's pretty cool. It may go in a drawer and stay there. In 40 years, he may pull that out and say, look what my mamma did for me one time. Little things mean a lot. I spent about 35 years in the telecommunications industry, and I did a lot of traveling. I had the pleasure of working for the chairman of the board, the founder of the company. He was about six foot eight, big guy, deep, booming voice. And I was, at that time, 25. He was probably 65, and I was scared to death of him. Brilliant, brilliant guy, extremely wealthy. He had me buying companies and going out and calling on him and, and trying to buy them. At a closing one time, we knew the price, just like a real estate closing. You go in there to write the check. All of a sudden, the price went up. And I had to make a decision whether or not I was going to pay that or not. And I decided to pay, to pay it. Now, all the accounts knew, the treasurer knew, but I did not want to go tell my boss that I raised the price without calling him. Probably not the smartest thing in the world to do. I deliberately waited about a month before I went back to Chicago thinking that, eh, he won't think about it. I walked into the office, and I had my bags on my back, and there he was standing there at the reception desk, and he said, Michael, I want to see you in my room. I thought, oh, man. So I dropped my bags. I followed him down the hall, and I had that look on my face, and every administrative assistant looked at me like, what have you done? He turned to go in his office and he looked at me and he said, you overpaid for that company. And I thought I was going to have to explain myself and he said, stop. And he said something to me that I'll never forget. He could have fired me. He could have crushed me. He could have sent me back to Knoxville on a plane and I'd have to face my wife and two kids with no job. But he said, old men like to see young men succeed. Old men like to see young men succeed. And that was like jet fuel running through my veins. Instead of killing my career, he made my career. And he said, now come on here and let's talk about this. And he called in the vice president of acquisitions. We talked, we had lunch. Man, I thought I was just walking on, on air at that point to have a boss that would take his time to explain what I should have done. What I did do, and he was interested in building a career and not destroying words of encouragement. When I was growing up, when I would visit Mamaw, we'd go to church on Sunday to Clear Branch Baptist Church there on Tazewell Pike in Plainview. Some of you might know where that is, it's a little old church, beautiful little church. One Sunday morning, there was three little boys sitting in the front, and the preacher was preaching on heaven and on hell. And those three little boys were just doing what boys sometimes do. They were acting up. After it was over, the preacher came down, and one of those boys said, Come on, preacher. You don't really believe there's a hell, do you? The preacher didn't get upset. He had a tear in his eye. And he said, Boys, let me tell you. Hell is very real, and separation from God is serious business. Now sit down there and pull out your Bibles and turn to Luke 16. And he read to us the rich man 
in Lazarus. And he said, now boys, I want you all to go home, talk to your mamas, come back and see me if you want to have Jesus in your heart, and I'm going to baptize you, and your name's going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But you go think about it. I know today there's three men because of that country preacher their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life because he took time to give that encouraging word when it was needed the most. And one of those smart mouth boys that asked that question is you're looking at him today. And without him, I'm not sure that I would have ever made that decision. Encouraging words, very important. I'm going to start to close and I want to go back to this vessel. Something useful, something beautiful. But I guess the best lesson of all is that, like our own bodies, it's going to age, it's going to crack, it could fail. What was really important is what was poured into this vessel. And what was poured out into someone's body, was it nourishing? Was it cool and refreshing at the time that person needed it? When you're saved, God gives you through the Holy Spirit gifts, a spiritual gift. And you have other talents to use. Are you using those talents to pour yourself into others when they need you the most. Kind words, encouraging words, knowing that all of us are on that wheel of life. and God wants us to mold us and make us into what he wants us to be. Watch out for hardening of the heart. Watch out for it. It's a slow process, usually accompanied by some kind of rationalization, excuses, things that happened to us in the past that we can't do anything about. Insensitivity to what God is trying to say to us and refusal of putting yourself under His authority with preoccupation with things of the world will harden your heart. The Lord wants us to have that heart of flesh, guys, where He just keeps molding us and making us into what he wants us to be. Useless in the hands of the world, but in the hands of the potter. Beautiful. He loves you so much. Christ died for our sins, was buried and walked in a newness of life so that we can have life. Are you hungry today? He's the bread of life. Are you in the dark? He's the light. Are you searching? He's the truth. Are you in need? He's the shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'll give you a few scriptures you may want to write down for words of encouragement that you may want to use later on. Hebrews 3.13 Encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12. Therefore, comfort and encourage each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good, necessary for edification that it might impart grace to the heavens. I went to pick up my grandson the other day 
I had to drive to Asheville. I got off on exit, four, uh, exit 50, and you take the exit, and you kind of wheel around, and there's a Starbucks there. And I decided to get a tea and some of that great lemon cake that they have. So I went in. I wanted to use the restroom. And as I came out, there was this uh, girl, about 26 years old, beautiful girl, coming out of the restroom. And I said, oh, go ahead, hon. I'm, I'm just here picking my grandson up. Go right ahead and order. So she went ahead of me, and she came to the register, and she ordered what she wanted. And then she looked at me, and she says, what are you having? And I said, well, I'm going to have some tea and some lemon cake. So she ordered it. And I said, oh, you don't have to do that. Don't, don't, don't pay for mine. I'm good. I've got plenty of time. She says, no, I want to do this for you. Welcome to Asheville. Pass it on. I never had heard of, no, pay it forward. I'm sorry, pay it forward. I never had heard of that, pay it forward. And she did, and she left, and I'll never see her again. But what a wonderful ambassador for Asheville she was. What a wonderful person she was to take the moment to pass forward something nice. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be anything material. But I've learned to pay it forward. Words of encouragement. When you leave here today, pay it forward. We all have things we're going through. Hold out that olive branch of love and understanding and realize that God is in control. Yeah.